This is the Volga, the great Russian river. It may sound like a cliché, but as you look at it, a folk melody starts playing in your head, and nine out of ten times, it has this distinct balalaika sound. Although, what else can it be? The balalaika is the most Russian instrument there is. Yet, if we delve deeper into its history, it's not 100% Russian. Or rather, it is, but its roots are not. But let's start at the beginning. This is our brand, and we're in Ulyanovsk. This is Ulyanovsk. Up until 1924, the city was called Simbirsk. It's one of the biggest industrial and transportation hubs of the Middle Volga region and has a population of 625,500 people. It is also the birthplace of Vladimir Lenin, the founder of the Soviet Union. And there are several museums in Ulyanovsk where you can learn about his time there. But our today's destination is a different kind of museum. The balalaika is a major symbol of Russian culture. Its iconic status was established in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, thanks to musician and composer Vasily Andreev. It was Andreev who brought the balalaika out of the folk realm and introduced it to the world of academic music, thus making the instrument extremely popular. Ulyanovsk's Balalaika Museum is a surprisingly popular place, which is evident from the steady flow of visitors. Besides looking at the objects and listening to the usual guides talk, they can try their hand at playing the balalaika. Or even making one. Press, but not too hard. Okay, I'll try. This way. Of course, the balalaika is a Russian instrument. It was developed and perfected by the Russian people. As to its originality, well, you know, human history is all about borrowing, deriving, and reimagining. This is Sergei Klučnikov, the founder of the museum. But this place is a part of a bigger project that Sergei and his friends have been developing for quite some time. The project, as you can guess, is all about the balalaika. So you can say that Sergei continues the legacy of Vasily Andreev. And in doing so, he and his friends have studied the history of the balalaika from A to Z. The idea, the concept of string instruments, where you either strum or pluck the strings using your fingers to produce the sound, at some point it was a revolutionary, a truly innovative idea. This concept originated somewhere in the Middle East. Think Iran, Iraq, Libya, and so on. And then the idea spread into the Turkic communities, peoples in the Caspian Sea region and to the east, to the west, to the north of it. And as they migrated, at some point they came here. I'm talking about the nomads, the Mongols, so we had to interact with them on many levels. Culturally as well. Yes, culturally as well. So it seems we adopted an unusual string instrument from them. Another word for string instruments is chordophones. Chord meaning string. The sound is produced from vibrating strings that are stretched between two fixed points. And the balalaika is a unique chordophone indeed, not least because of its characteristic triangular body. In the past, there were various body shapes, but the triangle came to be the standard. There are several explanations for that, and one theory reflects the truly Russian spirit of the instrument. A triangular body is easy to make. You don't need to bend wood into elaborate shapes. For instruments like this, you need semicircular molds and you have to consider all these curves when you fit the staves together. The process is more complex and demanding in terms of the craftsman's skills, while a triangular body is much easier to make. The signature shape of the balalaika was cemented thanks to Vasily Andreev and his collaborator, a musical instrument maker, Semyon Nalimov. In fact, they developed two varieties of the instrument, the traditional balalaikas that have since been used by amateur players for playing simple tunes, and the academic balalaikas that have been designed for professional performance of complex pieces. 
These two varieties differ in tunings, the number of frets, the materials used for strings, the string positions, and also in design. To see how easy it is to make a balalaika, we went to another facility established by Sergei and his team as part of their balalaika project. The Balalaikar factory is probably the biggest of their endeavors. Here we found further proof that the Balalaika is a truly Russian phenomenon. For instance, the parts of the instrument, common for all chordophones, have their own, typically Russian names. This is what guitar players call a neck, and in the balalaika, this part is called ruchka, or handle. So you have the handle and the body, or kuzov. The handle, the body. The back of the body, or the kuzov, is called zadinka, or zadinka. It's usually made of spruce with wood veneer. The body is made of staves. These? Yes, the staves. Yevgeny specializes in making balalaika bodies, but like most of the factory's masters, he can build any part. All these professionals have studied the craft and the methods on their own, by trial and error, seeking the perfect form, the perfect usability and the perfect sound. Maxim is making a soundboard. This is the first assembly stage. We call it Zakubrovka, attaching the top to the rest of the body. He has already prepared the soundboard. As you can see, he has attached the cross pieces that are necessary for good resonance. Like many of the factory's employees, Yevgeny plays the balalaika himself, which makes perfect sense. First, because for a non-musician, it's hard to evaluate the quality of their work. And second, because the traditional balalaika is very easy to learn. All you need to play a simple tune is to master three basic chords. The first one is called krilyechko, a porch. You strum down four times. One, two, three, four. The second chord is called pole, a field. It's the simplest chord. All strings are open. One, two, three, four. And the third chord is symmetrical to the krilyechka chord. It's called domek, a small house. Again, you strum four times. One, two, three, four. And back to the pole. One, two, three, four. And so on, starting from porch. Two, three, four. Field, 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 house. House, 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 field. This tune is called Podgorni, meaning at the foot of the mountain. We make about 200 instruments per month. So let's say they all sell out. In terms of numbers, if you make, say, 200 pieces a month, it makes for more than 2,000 pieces a year, 2,500, something like that. Honestly, I'm impressed. I've never expected the balalaika to be in such demand. And yet, on a national scale, it's not that much in terms of production volume. Because, let's face it, this most Russian instrument is kind of exotic now in its native country. You see, sometimes the professional folk music communities keep to themselves. They're pretty conservative and don't really go where the wider public is so to speak. And we think this is a counterproductive and self-defeating approach, because in the end, it causes the instrument to die out slowly. Alexei Archipovsky, Georgi Nefyodov, Andrei Kirikov, the Balalaika Mix Duo. These are just a few of the many musicians at the front end of the Balalaika revival. They pursue different styles and genres, but their music invariably strikes a chord with the audiences. I've played in lots of bands, all of which play different types of music. We're back in Moscow, 
Tonight, Georgi Nifyodov, a St. Petersburg musician, backed by one of his bands called Slovomira, meaning the word of the world, is playing a show in this club. As you remember, 150 years ago, Vasily Andreev helped to boost the Balalaika's popularity by introducing it into the world of academic music. Georgi Nefyodov strives to do the same, but he's taking an opposite approach by bringing the Balalaika back to the people. And so far, he's been quite successful. There is a demand and an appreciation. I can see that people are truly impressed. What strikes them most is, in my opinion, the richness of the instrument in terms of its sound and timbre. The most common reaction is something in the lines of, I never thought the balalaika could sound like this. Georgi's observations echo the words of Sergei Klutchnikov in Ulyanovsk. The balalaika has become less popular partly because it has fallen out of the public eye. We rarely see and hear it, and hence forget about its existence. And to fall in love with something, you first have to know it. I don't remember it being a conscious choice, like... I must play this exact instrument. It wasn't like that. My parents took me to a music school and asked what folk instrument I'd like to learn. I said, the balalaika maybe? And they were like, fine. I remember waking up and there would be a balalaika at my bedside and I would play it first thing in the morning. I would just sit on my bed and play for some time. And then I'd put the instrument aside and go about my day, go brush my teeth and all that. I really think that it's not that important what instrument you play. The limitations are all in your head. The freer you are and the bigger you think, the easier it is for you to express yourself through music. Thanks to people like Georgi and Sergei, we may soon rethink our perception of the balalaika as something exotic. Because really, how can it be exotic when this is our signature Russian brand?